I thought that since we've been going through the book of Colossians, we ought to focus in on one particular point in the book of Colossians. Um, do you remember what the key verse of Colossians is? I gave you a key verse for the book. Do you remember what it was? One what? That was the memory verse, yeah. That I, I probably confused you. The key verse of the book of Colossians, I think, my personal opinion, is verse 27 of chapter 1. And uh, the, the end of that verse is this, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you. That's the theme of Colossians. That you're not only in Christ, that's Ephesians, but Christ is in you, that's Colossians. And the New Testament makes that very clear. And so what I'd like to do this afternoon, just a few minutes, and we'll leave some time for uh, some interaction, some question or discussion or comment, is talk about God in a body in two ways. God incarnate in a human body in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then God or Christ incarnate in the Christian's body, which is Colossians 1, 27, Christ in you. Two incarnations. Often we just think there's one incarnation. There's actually two incarnations. There's the original one where God assumes a human body, takes on a human nature, where God is incarnate in a human body. Here's how Paul says it in 1 Timothy 3.16. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. And what that simply means is that uh, God came in a human body. And that's amazing, isn't it? You know, I've said this before, and it's not original with me, but it's, it is. I, I agree with this saying. What amazes me not so much is that God created us in his image, but rather that God was willing to be put in our image. When God incarnate came in a human body. And the Bible talks about this in many different ways. Did you know that the message that we preach called the gospel is a message of reconciliation? It's we're reconciling human beings to God. We're bringing Two warring parties, before a person's saved, they're at odds with God. They're really spiritually at war with God. They may not even realize it, but they are. Sin is at war with God and sin in us. And so when a person gets saved, they are reconciled with God. That message of reconciliation, which is what the gospel is, the Bible says that God that uh, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. So God in a human body for the purpose of bringing man and God together, reconciling them. God incarnate in a human body. God coming to earth, becoming a man in a human body that was formed in a, a young lady's womb. <laughs> Amazing. The infinite becomes an infant, likely like mankind. Fact of the matter is, God incarnate in a human body could be pictured this way. That is Christ for you. And it's the basis, as I already said, for your salvation. Listen to how the writer of Hebrews puts it in Hebrews chapter 10. I think this is a great Christmas uh, passage. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 5, it says, Wherefore, when he saith, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. Same passage, verse 10, speaking of Christ, by the which we are sanctified or saved through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once. For all. There's the big truth about what the first Christmas meant. 
Here's this is what we're celebrating when we when we celebrate the birth of Christ. And by the way, there's no emphasis in the Bible for celebrating the birth of Christ. We're not commanded to do that. We do that of our own free will. And uh, I'm neither for it nor against it. Okay. Uh, either way, I'm okay whether you celebrate it or not. But we should be very thankful all the time, not just one day out of the year, that God came, that God became enfleshed, that God came in a human body, God incarnate in a human body, because that's the only way that anyone could ever have been saved, because that was God's plan, okay? That was God's plan, because he came, as we've sung already today, he was born to die. The only reason Jesus was born was to die. In a sense, he came to not offer the sacrifice and offerings that were offered in the Old Testament, which were animals, but rather to offer his own body, his own life, his own blood. He gave as the one and final offering that forgives sin and saves a soul. Someone has oversimplified it, but it helps that people before Jesus came, they were saved by looking forward to the cross. And people after Jesus came are saved by looking back to the cross. And there's, there's truth into that. But God incarnate in a human body. But what I want to spend the rest of our time on in the minutes we have this afternoon is God or Christ incarnate in the Christian's body, in your body. God came in a human body, but now God has come into the believer's body. That's amazing. Let's take a moment and pray. Father, we'll never get this. It'll never really sink in. It'll never go deep enough until the Holy Spirit of God opens our spiritual eyes and causes us to see. And I pray that that would be the case this afternoon. Lord, may the truth, this remarkable truth, God in the believer's body, may that so grip us. May it have such an impact upon us that it would affect the way that we conduct ourselves, the way that we live our lives. It should make the difference. All the difference in this earthly life, in this world, is that Christ is in you. God is in you. What does that make you? That makes you the temple of God. What, a, what an amazing thing. Lord, use this in our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. And that's what he means when the Apostle Paul says, your body is the temple. It's the shrine of God. He dwells in human bodies because it's Christ in us. That's what he meant when he said, Christ liveth in me in Galatians 2.20. That's what he meant when he said, Christ in you, the hope of glory in Colossians 1.27. So, this is an even deeper truth than God incarnate in a human body is God incarnate in the believer's body, Christ in you, because that's not merely the basis for salvation. That's the basis for sanctification. That's the basis for living a godly life. If you're having trouble living a godly life, this is the truth that will deliver you. This is the truth that will bring about a transformation in your life. Christ in you. And you know what? It's an absolutely biblical truth. It was uh, foreshadowed even in the Old Testament. Listen to these verses. I think you'll you'll find this uh, interesting and, and helpful. When Moses was given the instructions to build the tabernacle, here's what God told him about uh, the building of it. He says, let them make a sanctuary, God speaking, that I may dwell among them. That's the hint. I want to I dwell among my people. I want to 
dwell among the people of God. In that same uh, 25th chapter of Exodus, listen to this. And thou shalt make it, he's talking about uh, that special table that they they led that that they laid out the 12 uh, loaves of the bread of the presence of God, the, the, the showbread. He said, thou shalt make a table and uh, overlay it with pure gold, make a crown uh, of gold around it, and thou shalt, uh, thou shalt make it of, uh, now let me back up a little bit. He's actually talking about the ark. I'm, I'm at the wrong piece of furniture. He's talking about the ark. You remember the ark of the covenant? You remember how significant that was? It was the piece of furniture in the tabernacle. It was the only piece that was actually in the Holy of Holies. That, that space in the tabernacle that was off limits even to the priesthood and even to the high priest except one day out of the year. Because the Ark of the Covenant represented God's presence among the people of Israel. In fact, God manifested his presence in Israel above the lid of the Ark of the Covenant that was called the mercy seat in that pillar cloud, that glory pillar cloud of uh, fire. And so he says this. He said, Thou shalt put the mercy seat above the Ark, and in the Ark thou shalt put the testimony, that's the tables of stone, the, the stone tablets that I give thee, and listen to this, and there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are upon the ark of the testimony. So you get the picture? I want to dwell with you, but I want to meet with you. I don't just want to live among you. I want to meet with you. I want to, I want to draw close to you. I want to commune with you. I want to have fellowship with you. That's the foreshadowing. And then in that uh, that same book of Exodus, and in the 31st chapter, and down into verse 3, this is significant. And the fact of the matter is, this is the first time in the entire Bible that we are told that there is a human being that is filled with the Holy Spirit. Here it is. Talking about uh, the craftsman that God gave skillfulness to build these, this, this tabernacle. He says in verse uh, 3, I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and all manner of workmanship or craftsmanship. There's another hint or foreshadowing of the fact God incarnate in the believer. Here he is. I want to dwell with you. I want to meet and commune with and fellowship with you. In fact, I'm going to fill you. And he filled not the first preacher, but he filled the first workman. Craftsman. Isn't that interesting? You don't have to be a preacher to be filled with the Spirit. You can be a day laborer and be filled with the Spirit. That's the whole point of it. The Spirit of God is needed by every person that is a child of God, and God wants to do that. And that's why we read in the Scripture that as a believer, Christ is in you, whoever you are. He's in you because it's foreshadowed in all of the Scripture. It's foretold by Jesus himself. Can you uh, hear this in Jesus' words in that upper room? where he's preparing his disciples for his departure. He's going to be crucified. And then he's going to, uh, after that, uh, 40 days later, he's going to ascend uh, to heaven. And so he's preparing them for his departure. And he says to them, uh, in, in that day, you shall know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. There's going to come a time when I'm gone, but I'm going to be here because I'm going to be in you. That same upper room uh, teaching in chapter 15 of John, he says, abide in me and I in you. He says, he that abideth in me and I in him. In chapter 17, what we call the uh, 
the Lord's Prayer, the high priestly prayer of the Lord. In John 17, 26, he says, <clears throat> Wherewith thou hast loved me, and uh, may be in them, and I in them. Jesus speaking to his Father, I want to be in them. I'm going to be in them, meaning his people. So it's foreshadowed in the Old Testament. It's foretold by Jesus. And the whole New Testament fosters the idea, develops that idea, and explains it, especially the Apostle Paul. He says in Romans 8.10 that if Christ be in you, you're dead to sin. That's what he says. If Christ be in you, you're dead to sin. In 2 Corinthians 13.5, he says, Christ is in you, and if he's not, you're not saved. In other words, if you are saved, Christ is in you. You don't have to be on any spiritual level to have Christ in you. If you're saved, he is in you. In Ephesians 3.17, he says that we are strengthened in our heart, in the inner man, by Christ who is in us. In Colossians 1.27, again, Christ in you. In uh, 1 John 4 and verse 4, greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. And so the whole New Testament develops and explains what it means to have Christ in you. All right. Understanding that that's a biblical truth. How does this matter of God incarnate in the believer's body? What is the practical truth here? I mean, how does that make a difference in my life as a believer? How can that be experienced by believers? Well, did you know it's been experienced by believers all throughout the history of the church? Ever since it happened, it's been experienced by believers. It, first of all, was experienced in the past by the disciples. Remember, on the 50th day, Jesus left the earth after 40 days after his resurrection, 40 days after his resurrection, he was, he was, uh, he was ascended to heaven. Ten days later, Jesus descended from heaven via, in the person of, his spirit, the spirit of God. And that's when this truth became first functional and practical. They were transformed. Hey, these guys... We're in that upper room where Jesus shared that truth of them, and they were scared to death. They had the doors locked. They were afraid that they were going to be found out and that they were they were going to suffer the uh, similar punishment to what Jesus suffered. And so they're they're afraid. But on the day of Pentecost, when Christ comes into them, they're no longer afraid. Now they're bold. Now, when they pray in chapter 4 and verse 31, after they have suffered the first persecution, they're not afraid. They're praying that the Lord would simply enable them to continue on in his power. And the place where they prayed that prayer was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Christ in you. It happened to these people. The Apostle Paul makes it so clear. He said, you know what? I was going one direction. I didn't believe in Jesus the Messiah, but he got a hold of me on that road to Damascus, and he revealed his son in me. He revealed his son in me, and that's the reason I'm revealing his son to you. He revealed his son in me, he says, so that Christ liveth in me, and the life that I live in this body, he said, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I live by dependence upon him living his life in me. For to me, he says, to live is Christ. Christ is my life. That's Paul. And he was just one of many believers ever since that have uh, believed this truth that God is incarnate in the believer's body. I have a book here that I would recommend. You can find, probably find it on Amazon pretty cheap. Even a used copy would be great. It's called They Found the Secret by uh, V. Raymond Edmund. And it's the, the subtitle, 
20 transform lives that reveal a touch of eternity. These are people that came to understand and to draw upon the truth, Christ in you. J. Hudson Taylor is the first one. Another one, John Bunyan, heard of him? Amy Carmichael, um, Oswald Chambers, my utmost for his highest, that devotional. Um, Dwight Lyman Moody, D.L. Moody, Andrew Murray, um, Ian Thomas, 20 transformed lives, just 20. There's thousands. This is just a sampling. The point is simply this. People, ever since the Holy Spirit descended upon the church and formed the church, Christ in you has been a reality and has been a practical experience in believing lives. One of those men, he's not in this book, but one of those men was a, a, a Baptist pastor in England back in the 1800s. His name was F.B. Meyer. And I want to quote from him. He says, every saved person has Christ in his heart. But like, a heavy, like that heavy veil that hid the holy of holies from the holy place, so Christ may be in your heart, but uh, you may have never recognized that he's there. And though he's been in your heart, he, his presence is hidden from your eyes. It's veiled. And the two hands that tore that veil of the temple from the top to the bottom must tear the veil in your inner life that Christ who's there may be revealed in you. You need the veil torn <laughs> in your inner person, in your heart, to recognize and to then reveal the fact Christ is in you. Christ is in your human body. Your human body is, in essence, an incarnation of God himself because Christ is in you. It's a fact. Colossians 1.27, Christ in you. It's not a figure of speech. It's not a figment of your imagination, but it is, it is a glorious, uh, supernatural, biblical fact. You don't need to pray for Christ to be in you, but you simply need to count upon it as a truth that just as he became, God became incarnate in Jesus of Nazareth. The Son of God becomes incarnate in the believer. Christ in you. It's a fact. But for it to be a practical truth in your life, that fact has to be translated into your life through faith. Faith is the key. Faith is what opens the door. Faith is the access point to the reality and the practicality and the function of Christ who is already in you being revealed through you. The Holy Spirit, in response to your dependence, will at the moment that you need transfer into your life the strength you need or the qualities that you need that reside, those qualities, that strength resides in all their fullness in Jesus, and he's in you. So what is it that you need? At any moment, maybe you have a lack of patience at a certain point. Well, he's the fullness of patience. Maybe you have a lack of courage at a particular time. Well, he is the fullness of courage. Maybe it's power or authority that you need at that moment. He is the fullness of that. Maybe it's kindness that you need. He can provide that. Maybe it's peace and, and a calmness of heart. He is that in you. Maybe it's endurance and long-suffering that you need. Or perhaps it's joy. He's everything and more than that. You can, uh, you can draw anything that you need from the Christ that dwells in you. And sometimes I've been tempted to, when not thinking, and perhaps you have too, we, we have envied people that uh, walked with Jesus a couple thousand years ago on this earth, like perhaps those two disciples on the Emmaus Road. You know, I would have, honestly, I would have liked to have heard his exposition 
of the Old Testament scriptures. However, I don't envy those two disciples because although their heart burned within them, they just hosted him one night. We host him 24-7, 365 days a year. He's in us. Christ is in us. And so regardless what you may do, it's possible to be conscious of God in you, of God's presence in you. Are you conscious of God's presence in you right now? Are you conscious of God's presence in you when you're on the job or when you're in a classroom uh, or whatever you're doing? You know, every morning, my wife and I sit down together in the living room and we read. And uh, we're both totally focused on what we are personally reading. But at the same time, we're conscious of each other's presence in that living room. Sometimes, periodically, we may even make eye contact or... If uh, we're close enough, may even reach our hand out and, and just uh, squeeze the hand, even though we're focused on what we're reading. Even when we are totally absorbed in things, whatever the things might be, we can be conscious of God's presence in the depths of our spirit. It, it just as real as when we are free to totally devote our thoughts to thinking on God and the things of God. Because Christ is in you. And when he's real, you'll never forget.